Welcome to Newsday on the BBC. I'm Sharon Jitlail in Singapore. The headlines. You're playing with fire. Russia warns Britain at the UN over the Salisbury poisonings. London dismisses Moscow's request for cooperation. I think the metaphor that I find most apt is that of an arsonist turned firefighter. Waiting for her fate, a court in South Korea prepares to deliver the verdict in former President Park Yun hees corruption trial. I'm Kasia Madeira in London, also in this programme. Prison looms for Lula. Brazil's former president is told to turn himself in and start serving a 12-year jail term for corruption. And one of Bollywood's biggest stars, Salman Khan, is sentenced to five years in jail for killing two rare antelopes nearly 20 years ago. Live from our studios in Singapore and London. This is BBC World News. It's Newsday. Good morning. It's 8 a.m. here in Singapore, 1 a.m. in London, and uh, 8 o'clock in the evening in New York, where the UN Security Council has been meeting at Russia's request. Moscow's ambassador to the United Nations made a strongly worded speech rebuffing the UK's accusation that Russia was behind the poisoning of Sergei Skripal and his daughter Yulia in the city of Salisbury last month. Here's our diplomatic correspondent, James Landale. It's just over four weeks since Sergei and Yulia Skripal were found poisoned by a nerve agent on this bench in Salisbury. Four weeks during which the former Russian intelligence officer and his 33-year-old daughter have lain critically ill, at times in a coma. But today, Ms. Skripal revealed that she, at least, was on the mend. In a statement issued on her behalf by the police, she said, I woke up over a week ago now, and I'm glad to say my strength is growing daily. I'm grateful for the interest in me and for the many messages of goodwill that I've received. Today, Russian television broadcast an unverified recording of an alleged phone call between Yulia Skripal and her cousin Victoria. She's hoping to come to Britain to visit Ms. Skripal with the help of Russian diplomats, if British officials are prepared to risk giving her a visa. In London, the Russian ambassador welcomed the news that Ms. Skripal was recovering. I'm really happy. And I hope that the Sergei uh, Skripal will also recover. And uh, I'm quite sure that one day Yulia will uh, come back to Moscow. But he once again denied any Russian involvement in the attack. So amid the claims and counterclaims, what is the UK case? Theresa May says the substance used is Novichok, a type of nerve agent developed by Russia. British scientists say this military-grade agent can probably be made only by a nation-state, but they don't say which one. Instead, it is secret intelligence that the government says implicates Russia, a conclusion that has the international support of dozens of countries. But Russia rejects this and says Britain lacks real evidence. It denies ever producing Novichok, but says other countries could have done so. It's requested samples of the substance for testing, and it's called for Russian officials to be involved in a joint investigation. At the United Nations this evening, there were smiles between ambassadors, but not for long, as Russia accused Britain of fabricating intelligence to question the legitimacy of the Russian state. Couldn't you come up with a better fake story? We all know what the worth of British intelligence information is, based on the experience with Tony Blair. We have told our British colleagues that you're playing with fire and you will be sorry. Britain, in turn, accused Russia of playing fast and loose with international security. But we cannot ignore what has happened in Salisbury. We cannot ignore Russia turning a blind eye to the use of chemical weapons in Syria and in Salisbury. And we cannot ignore the way that Russia seeks to undermine the international institutions which have kept us safe since the end of the Second World War. This confrontation between Britain and Russia is not over yet, not by a long chalk. James Landell, BBC News. So a fiery exchange between Russia and the UK at the UN Security Council. But despite that, Chris Buckler in Washington told me that neither country seems to have provided more evidence over who was responsible for the poisoning. 
in a way, this was a series of prepared statements of claim and counterclaim, of accusation and denial, with both countries determined to make their point. It's worth remembering that this was a meeting that was called for by Moscow. That's what they wanted. And there was an attempt here to raise concerns, to raise questions, and also plant a lot of doubts. Saying that, if you watch that meeting and you, you watch just the expressions of those sitting around it, I don't think any of the countries will have changed their minds about what has happened here. The UK and many other countries, including America, including France, including many other countries, they all believe that Russia was responsible for this. Russia continues to deny that. And I don't think that is going to change in the weeks coming. Yes, the UK, they're very much sticking to its position. The OPCW is investigating. We are going to get the findings next week, but even then, Russia's going to simply reject them. Yeah, and a part of that is the frustration that Russia wants to be involved in that investigation. They say that they have a right to be involved in it. They have passed a series of official notes demanding to be a part of that investigation. And I, I think it's inevitable that having not been a part of the investigation, there is a good chance that they will reject whatever it comes out with. Of course, the UK will continue to push, saying that they believe that Russia was involved in this. So in an odd kind of way, no matter what this investigation says, it isn't going to matter the results of it, because fundamentally, these two countries are in two different corners. You have the UK and many of their allies standing against Russia, and they will both continue to say, yes, Russia were involved, and Russia will continue to say, no, it has nothing to do with us, and the UK needs to look at itself. So, stalemate there. That was Chris Buckler reporting from Washington. Let's take a moment to have a look at some of the day's other news stories because nearly two weeks after his arrest, Catalonia's former leader, Carles Puigdemont, will be released on bail. A German court has ruled extraditing him on rebellion charges but says that he could still be sent back to Spain to face corruption charges. Spain accuses Mr. Puigdemont of encouraging rebellion when he led Catalonia's push for independence last year. Brazil's former president has until Friday afternoon to turn himself into police and begin serving his 12-year jail term for corruption. Luis Inácio Lula da Silva was requesting to remain free during his appeals process, but on Wednesday, a judge ruled against that, ruining his chances of running in October's presidential election, which he was the favorite to win. Six activists have been jailed in Vietnam for attempting to overthrow the state. Their sentences are between 7 and 15 years, the harshest in years as the communist country tightens its grip on critics. Those jailed include lawyers accused of holding human rights training and pushing for a multi-party democracy in Vietnam. And patients had to be evacuated when this intense fire broke out at a hospital in Istanbul. Now, the blaze started on the roof of the building. The flames then rapidly engulfed this hospital's exterior cladding. Officials say that there are no reports of casualties so far, at least. A court in Seoul will sentence the former South Korean president, Park geun hye for her part in a corruption scandal which led to her being removed from office. And she faces 18 charges, including bribery, abuse of power and coercion. Uh, prosecutors have demanded some 30 years in prison and a fine of about $146 million for the former president. Our correspondent in Seoul, Laura Bicker, looks back at the downfall of a leader and the extraordinary protests that led to her impeachment. Week after week, the streets of Seoul were bathed in candlelight. They gathered in their millions to overthrow a leader involved in a huge corruption scandal. The peaceful movement gathered pace and strength and proved too powerful for South Korea's president. The charges facing Park Geun Hye are tied to her relationship with friend and advisor Che Soon Chil. She used her presidential connections to pressure huge businesses, including electronics giant Samsung, for millions of dollars in donations to foundations she controlled. President Park apologized twice, but her approval ratings fell to just 5%. And opposition leaders worked to gather votes to impeach her. They were eventually successful. 
Her now dwindling number of supporters were distraught. But most saw it as a victory for this young democracy. People power has finally cut all ties with authoritarian rule. Park Geun-hye was the daughter of Park Ching-hee, who seized power in a coup in 1961. He ruled for 18 years until he was gunned down in 1979. She entered the political arena amid the global financial crisis in 2008. A worried older generation craved stability and remembered her father's authoritarian rule. She won the presidency with a slim margin of 51%. Her downfall has rocked the political elite in Seoul and stoked anger over ties between government and big corporations. It's hoped the verdict will help usher in a new era. If we are doing good, then people power uh, will back us, will be our allies. But if we are doing bad, then they will you know, punish us and, and impeach us and will accuse us and criticize us. Park Geun-hye is unlikely to be in court for her sentencing, but it will be watched closely by those who've long hoped for justice. Well, Laura Bicker with that report, and she joins us now live from Seoul. So, Laura, what are most people in South Korea expecting today? Will she be jailed, and what will that then mean for the nation? Well, prosecutors are seeking a 30-year jail term. I think it's unlikely they'll get that. Her um, co-conspirator, the aide and friend um, who was at the centre of the scandal, got 20 years. Um, but I think people are, uh, certainly those who spent 17 weeks on the streets of Seoul, are hoping that she will get a significant uh, jail term. She will not be there for her sentencing, we understand. She hasn't turned up to any of her court hearings and that certainly has disappointed many who wanted to see justice done. But I think the main thing for people here in South Korea is that they want the links between or the established links between government and conglomerates to end and they want the government to be more transparent so it's hoped that today's verdict acts in some way as a turning point as a way of saying look those days of the past those days of corruption and bribery and governments doing whatever they want are over that's right uh, Laura and of course we're watching that verdict expecting it just after 2 p.m. local time over there in Seoul now it, it does seem that South Korea as a nation has a lot to contend with it's got a very mercurial warlike nation to the north and you had all of this political upheaval uh, at home so does it is there a sense that if Park Geun-hye is jailed uh, you know a line will be drawn under the domestic political issues at least I think when it comes to the people power that you saw there, the 17 weeks on the streets, the fact that they managed to overthrow a president, I think when politicians, and, and I spoke to one in, for the piece, I said, well, hang on a second, does this worry you or hearten you that people can actually overthrow a president? And he says, well, it heartens me to see the democracy in action. But yes, it is worrying because if they are corrupt, politicians know now that if they are corrupt, if things do go wrong, if they abuse their power, people here in South Korea will act and they have done before and been successful before so yes I think there is a, a feeling that they're going to try and draw a line but there's a lot to do because there are still many uh, conglomerates there's still uh, this idea that the old tables like th those uh, massive companies are still not transparent enough so I think there's a feeling here that they want that to change the culture to change and that may take more time than just one verdict today all right laura bicker there's going to be a busy day for you and your team watching that in a few hours from now thank you well you're watching newsday on the bbc still to come on the program one of bollywood's biggest stars jailed for poaching a rare antelope Salman khan has been sentenced to five years in prison also coming up on the program, the Malaysian government cracks down on so-called fake news with massive fines and jail time. Critics say, though, this is an attack on free speech. Welcome back. You're watching Newsday on the BBC. I'm Sharon Jitlail in Singapore. 
And I'm Kasia Madeira in London. Our top stories. At a meeting of the UN Security Council, Russia dismisses the allegation that it poisoned a former double agent living in England. A court in South Korea is expected to deliver a heavy punishment to former President Park Geun-hye in one of the nation's biggest corruption scandals. Well, let's now look at some of the front pages from around the world now. We can start with the South China Morning Post in Hong Kong, uh, which says Beijing might be forced to compromise into opening its markets as it tries to diffuse those trade tensions with the United States. Now, the Post suggests uh, another option is to cut import tariffs on American products, which could meet U.S. demands to narrow the trade gap. And the Japan Times, uh, if we take a look, has a dramatic front page picture uh, as another powerful eruption is observed at Mount Shinmoe in uh, southwestern Japan with ash sent spiraling hundreds of meters into the sky. And in other news now, a cesspool tainted by dumped sewage. That's how the government in the Philippines has described the island of Boracay when they announced that they would be closing the island to tourists for six months. Boracay is one of the best known holiday islands in the Philippines. It's famous for its white beaches and stunning sunsets. And local officials estimate that the island attracts about two million visitors at least it did last year. And it pumps roughly $1 billion into the Philippine economy each year. Then this week, the announcement came that the island would be closed to all tourists. And since the announcement, low-cost carrier Air Asia has suspended all of its domestic and international flights to Boracay until further notice. And fears are growing for how the thousands of residents who rely on tourism will survive six months of forced closure. Kiko Rustia owns a bed and breakfast. Basically, the closure is going to start on April 26, and that's roughly 21 days from now. And yet, we still don't have any uh, concrete plans as to what they really plan to do to the island. I know that their intentions is to rehabilitate the island, but there hasn't been any design that was um, shown to us. Um, no, no budget. We don't know anything about the whole project. And basically, everyone here is in limbo because the island survives on tourism. And once they close the island um, from tourists, how are we going to survive? Uh, where, where are we going to get our income? Well, Jose Clemente is the president of the Tourism Congress of the Philippines, representing hoteliers and tourism operators. And he told me earlier that this has been a long-term issue. The problem has been there for, for many years. Uh, there has been some neglect, admittedly. We've not been as responsible as we should have been. Uh, but that being the case, we're now uh, putting all our efforts into uh, upgrading and uh, creating Boracay, recreating Boracay as a very uh, sustainable destination. So for the tourists who've booked holidays, who now are going to have to cancel their travel plans, what can be done for them? Uh, we have been in discussion with some of our uh, stakeholders on the island. and. Uh, a lot of them are uh, willing to do a full refund for those uh, whose vacations will be um, disrupted by this, or we can also direct them to the other uh, beach uh, destinations that we have in the Philippines. Right. Uh, we do have 7,000 islands, so there are a lot of places where we can uh, bring them as well. But obviously, it's incredibly painful for people like Kiko, <coughs> the bed and breakfast owner we just heard from. Boroka, in fact, employing some 17,000 people as well as 11,000 construction workers. Uh, so what happens to them, especially those working uh, in the tourism sector? Well, uh, our primary concern right now is, uh, yes, to address uh, the workers that will be displaced. As of yesterday, uh, the government has laid out some plans, but nothing... Uh, really concrete as of yet. So uh, from the side of the uh, private sector, we are, we are going to do what we can to make sure that uh, a lot of these people uh, sort of uh, still make uh, some sort of living while, while the island is closed. To Sharajit a little earlier, let's turn to Malaysia now, where the government is coming down hard on so-called fake news, with fines of up to $123,000 and as much as six years in jail for anyone caught spreading this false news. Now, the new legislation covers digital news and social media. 
Critics have called the bill an attempt to stifle dissent. Well, Michael Vatikiutis is the regional director of Singapore Centre for Humanitarian Dialogue. He's in London, and a short time ago, I pointed out that the definition of fake news in this new law is rather vague. Yes, and, and I think it's uh, very much focused on the Prime Minister's own concerns about the corruption scandal that surrounds him. Which uh, he's always denied. Which any... he's always denied. But I think the, 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 the way in which the media, not just in Malaysia, but outside Malaysia, has focused on this scandal, has, I think, you know, forced the government, which already has a battery of laws that limits media freedom, to try and find something to go after those who would make these accusations. So how does this law then differ from the laws that are already available in Malaysia? It's very broad uh, and it's very subjective and ma makes me wonder to what extent actually unlike the other laws which uh, are really quite restrictive uh, sedition for instance, the sort of colonial era, um, I think this one is so broad but the flip side may be that it may be open to legal challenge as well because you know if the government itself and we've seen in other countries of the region governments attempts to sort of accuse the media of purveying false news fake news um, if the government itself um, is, is unable to stand those charges up they could be they could be challenged in court and the, the, there has already been considerable public outcry and the courts what, are, what exactly are they doing so far about well I mean what we've seen in Malaysia in, in recent uh, in recent years is actually the courts are becoming a bit more active. There have been recent uh, court cases, that, uh, court decisions that have defended uh, constitutional rights and not so much on the government side. Um, so I think uh, what we might see in Malaysia is that you know, this kind of uh, broadening of, of, of the crackdown on the media could well be challenged in courts. Having said that, I think if we look at the election, it's clear that it's unlikely the opposition is going to make much headway. And I, I think this just speaks to the Prime Minister's insecurity uh, and the feeling that he's being targeted. The election, of course, has to take place before August. Parliament could be dissolved as, as soon as, well, as imminently, in fact. What's the chain of events? Well, I think, you know, this is a very highly anticipated uh, election because, um, not just because of the Prime Minister's own difficulties, but because of a number of uh, economic challenges facing Malaysia and, and the fact that the opposition in the last two elections has made considerable gains. However, I do think it's unlikely that the opposition will win. Um, and I think this is, you know, this crackdown on the media, which we're seeing around the region, incidentally, I mean, this is not just a trend confined to Malaysia, um, is another sign um, that the gains that democratic government have made over the last 20 years in Malaysia and in the region as a whole are being slowly eroded. But it's not, you say it's not just Malaysia, but Malaysia is particularly, this is particularly stringent when it comes to this law. Well, it, yes, but if we, if we look at Cambodia and also the Philippines, there have been very, you know, severe uh, crackdowns on the media and, you know, the targeting, especially in the Philippines, uh, you know, of quite well-known media organizations by the government. And I think this has in turn drawn off, I think, to some extent uh, from the way that President Trump's administration has described the media, um, and the use of the term fake news. It's been embraced by these leaders in Southeast Asia, and this is unfortunate. That's Michael Vatikirti speaking earlier to Kasha. Now, one of Bollywood's biggest stars, Salman Khan, has been sentenced to five years in prison for poaching rare black buck antelope. Now, the case dates back to 1998. And Khan, who's 52, has appeared in more than 100 films. His lawyer has said they will appeal the sentence on Friday. From Delhi, Rajini Vajanadan has more. He's one of the world's highest paid actors. Salman Khan is known as the bad boy of Bollywood, both on and off screen. Sir, please! Sir, please! Today he was in court after a judge found him guilty of killing two black bucks, an endangered breed of antelope. The case dates back to 1998, when he was shooting for this film, Hamsat Sarpay. Few celebrities are as worshipped or idolised as Salman Khan is here in India. His cult status is so huge that it's unlikely that this conviction will dent his popularity or damage his career. This isn't his first brush with the law. In 2015, he was found guilty of killing a homeless man near his house in Mumbai in a hit and run, but was acquitted later that year. Salman Khan's lawyers say he'll appeal the sentence and apply for bail. But tonight, one of Bollywood's biggest stars is behind bars. 
Regina Vardy in Alden, BBC News, Delhi. From me, from Sharon Jeep, the whole Newsday team. Bye bye.